Good morning, everyone. Thank you for being in our class today. And thank you for your interest in our continued study of the Word of God. I trust you have your Bibles this morning as well as your foundation's study guide. And so I would ask that you be turning in your Bibles to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and that you be opening your study guide to lesson number 7 that begins on page 64. You know, I was thinking this week, I remember a few years ago when I, would, when I was helping here and I would fill in once in a while for Dr. Lloyd and I remember that in one particular quarter there were two times that I filled in for him. And one time was a lesson about funding the work of the church. And of course, that's a subject that no one really wants to talk about, talk about church members and their money. And then the other time, the lesson was about remember your creator in the days of your youth. And so during the week, I was thinking about just calculating in my mind the median age of the people who generally are members of an auditorium class. And so this time around when Dr. Lloyd said, I will go first and then you'll take the next one and then I'll do the next one. I started looking ahead trying to determine, is there a hook in, so in here somewhere, you know? But we're very blessed to, to be able to study the books of First and Second Thessalonians. And we were blessed last Sunday as Dr. Lloyd talked to us about Paul's call to the will of God. To, to sanctification, to our being set apart as God's people, our, be, our being set apart as, as Christians, and how that is made manifest in godly behavior and a commitment for us to do what God wants us to do more than what we want to do. And that whole theme, that theme of the Christian's daily walk it just continues here in chapter 4, and we're going to resume listening to Paul as we read beginning at verse 9. But we don't need to write to you about the importance of loving each other, for God himself has taught you to love one another. Indeed, you already show your love for all the believers throughout Macedonia. Even so, dear brothers and sisters, we urge you to love them even more. And let's just pause right there. Even though he did write to them about the importance of loving each other, you will note that Paul says, I really didn't have to. It was not necessary for me to write to you about this. They had learned from God how to love. It was seen. It was evident. It was clear all throughout Macedonia. And Paul just encourages them, I want you to keep it up. Keep on loving. As a matter of fact, you need to love even more. So the whole process of sharing the gospel, the whole process of sharing the good news and doing so with credibility, I want you to notice it is rooted right here. This is very important. Remember, we have learned that the Thessalonians were victims in their day of what many still suffer today, religious abuse. And you know exactly what is meant by that, don't you? Clerical types, whoever they may be, using fear and manipulation and even lies to push their particular brand of religion on other people and not out of pure motives. They do so for a variety of selfish reasons. To get rich, to be popular, to gain power. And that's why Paul has already insisted in this letter, we never did that. You will never find us doing that. We never tried to trick you. There is a Greek word that is used just here and in Paul's writings to, to identify this. It is the word dolos. The word that we translate trick. And that word is, is used to describe a lure. Specifically, a fishing lure to describe bait. Writer Leon Morris talks about the day and time 
in which Paul wrote this letter. And I want to read you an excerpt from one of his books in which he says, There has probably never been such a variety of religious cults and philosophic systems as there was in Paul's day. Holy men of all creeds and countries, philosophers, magicians, astrologers, crackpots and cranks, they all jostled and they all clamored for attention. So Paul insists that having the right message means absolutely nothing if it is given with wrong motives. So we can't miss, as we go through this study, Paul identifying that the only right motive is love. He's telling his brethren, I I really don't need to write to you about loving. You're doing a marvelous job. God's taught you how to love, but I'm writing to you anyway, and I'm encouraging you love even more. I think there is much for us to learn from Paul about how he sought to share the good news of the kingdom, the good news about Jesus Christ with people who did not know him. You see, Paul understood you couldn't do this as a stranger. You could do it only as a friend. And as a matter of fact, Paul would take it to the next step and he would say, even closer than a friend, you need to do it as if you are a relative. Rick Warren writes, we will never convert the world as long as we are their enemy. We will only convert them as their friend. I think he was exactly right. Paul sought to build relationships of trust with other people. He encouraged people. He comforted people. And he recognized a fundamental truth And that is that trust is a prerequisite of listening. He understood that relationship has to come first before people will listen. I don't know about you, but it is hard for me to to really listen. I mean really listen to a message of importance if it's coming from someone I don't trust. I just think about that for a moment. So there is something of great significance here for all of us who want to share the gospel with other people who have been called to spread the good news about Jesus who need it to people who need it so badly. And we have to be something to them. We have to be something in their lives before we have the right to say something. Now, once in a while... I'll have someone come and knock on my door, and perhaps you've had that experience as well. And I'm thinking back to a time where some folks on a couple of bicycles came, and they knocked on my door, and they wanted to talk to me about Jesus, and they wanted to talk to me about the truth, and I was as nice and kind as as you could possibly be. And I conversed with a man. I mean, I sat down, and we, we had a lively discussion. But the truth is... You can't come and knock on my door, a complete stranger, and and expect to receive an audience from me where you're going to begin to preach to me about my life and about what I should and should not do, what I should and should not think, how I should and should not live, when I don't know you, when I do not trust you, when I do not have a relationship with you. Now, you can try. That'd be all right, but I can promise you it's not going to work. I'm too hard-headed. It's not going to work. What if we all, what if we all just considered our own personal calling to be among the people that we already know and we already love? We, We are all called by Scripture to bless our neighbors. So how would your relationships change How would your relationships with people change if those who already populated your life, the people that God has already put in the path of your daily life, if you just looked at them and you saw yourself as having been sent to them on behalf of Jesus? Think about that for a moment. Earn the right to say something to them by first being something to them. Earn the right to tell them about Jesus 
because they now know you and they trust you and they love you because of the way you've treated them, because of the way you have loved them. Love them, befriend them, eat with them, serve them, laugh with them, cry with them, help them. Ask them to help you. And at some point in that relationship, they are going to want to know. They're going to want to know what is different. They're going to want to know why you have the interest that you do in them and in their lives. Why you've befriended them. Why you've been so kind to them. And telling them about Jesus in that scenario will come so natural. There will be nothing artificial about it at all. Love them even more, Paul says. And friends, you know, if we do that, when we do that, I believe we will experience joy that we've not experienced before. I believe we will experience miracles of change that we never thought possible. We first have to be something to people before we have earned and merited the right to say something. So go back to the text now, and let's resume at verse 11. Make it your goal. You may have a translation that says aspire to. Make it your ambition. Make it your goal to live a quiet life, minding your own business and working with your hands just as we instructed you before. Then people who are not believers will respect the way you live, and you will not need to depend on others. So there are three things that Paul's going to talk about here that are very important. Live a quiet life, mind your own business, and work with your hands. Make it your earnest ambition to be leading a quiet life. Consider it honorable to do so. I'm going to tell you, I'll give you a little preview here. When we get to the book of 2 Thessalonians, specifically chapter 3... Paul is going to have to say, friends, I hate to tell you this, but there are some of you who are in fact not leading a quiet life. In fact, some of you are leading a very undisciplined life. You're not working. You're acting like a bunch of busybodies. And he will say to them, you just need to stop. You need to stop. Remember now in this setting. There was a lot of upheaval that was going on and these people were suffering and they were being persecuted. And Paul says, you know what? God has taught you how to love and you are doing so well with that. Live quiet lives. Don't live your life in such a way that your conduct disturbs the peace that you have found in him. Mind your own business. Some translations render this, attend to your own business. I want to ask you a question. Did your parents ever say to you, mind your business? Did they ever say that to you? Well, that wasn't just their idea. It, it, it's a biblical idea. Now, I've told you before, and you'll probably hear me say it many times because it's such a part of my life. There are five boys in my house every day. Before they go to school every day, they eat breakfast together every morning. They go to school together. They come home together. They play ball together lots of afternoons. And you can probably imagine some things that I say to them over and over and over and over and over and over and over again. Can you imagine what some of those might be? Stop. Don't. Keep your hands to yourself. And so I've found an all-encompassing phrase that I like to use, and that phrase is, mind your business. Mind your business. And I'm hoping that maybe I can teach them that. that they love, they just love to be all up in each other's business. Bruce writes, there is a great difference between the Christian duty of putting the interest of others first and the busybody's compulsive itch to set other people right. We need to think about that. Adam Clark adds that Paul doesn't mean that we're all supposed to just separate ourselves and live apart from each other and to have no concern for each other. Adam Clark says that's not what he's talking about. 
He says what Paul means is we are not to be disruptors of people's lives. So you go back to that first idea of being something in order to have the right to say something so that people will listen to us. we got to learn how to live before them. And that goal will never, ever be accomplished if we are constantly about the business of meddling in the affairs of others. Do you like it when somebody got their nose in your business? You don't, do you? Now, I am amazed, just Jim, but I am amazed at the world we all now occupy. And I, I'm especially amazed in our own culture at how many people believe the whole world needs to know what I think on every subject. Amen. Would you agree with that? Now, there are a lot of you who, who are on Facebook and, and you do whatever you want to do. But I, I'm, it, it, it always amazes me why somebody thinks I need to see a picture of what they had for lunch. <laughs> you know, I'm, I, uh, I, I, I really don't care what they had for lunch. But they're going to show me that picture, you know. And I'm amazed at how many people in our culture think it is important that the whole world knows what I think on every single subject. You know what I want a baseball player to do? I want him to throw the ball, hit the ball, catch the ball, get the out. I, I don't really care about his politics. Don't want to know about him. I, I would not describe the world that we live in just now as a world where for the most part, most people live a quiet life. Would you? I certainly wouldn't. I would not describe our world just now, I certainly would not describe it, as a culture, a society in which most people mind their own business. Now friends, I'm going I'm to make honest confession to you this morning. There are times when I do not want you to know what I am thinking. As a matter of fact, you don't need to know. It would not be good for you to know. And there are lots of times when I am exhorting myself, that little voice that's on the inside, I'm exhorting myself, Jim, do not say what just came into your mind. Do not let what just came into your mind, don't let that pass your lips. Be quiet. Mind your own business. Everybody does not have to know and everybody does not need to know what you think. And then Paul adds a third and, and also very important exhortation. Work. A four-letter dirty word in our world. Work with your own hands. I listened to a news story this week. This week. And I'll bet you there are people in here who saw this same story about how many jobs there are now available as we are emerging from the pandemic in our society that employers cannot fill because, are you ready for it? People will not work. And I'm sitting there scratching my head and thinking, okay, I'd, I'd, I'd like to know why. And the man on the street interview was conducted and they went and talked to a lot of these people. And I'll give them credit, they didn't lie about it. They were very candid about why. Until my government money stops coming, I'm not going to work. I'm staying home. Now, I'm not, I'm not taking a political position just here or challenging anyone else's. What I am doing is I am telling you that God's plan for the good of man, for the progress of society, for those who are a part of the church, is that we work. That's part of God's plan. There is dignity and there is honor in work. And I will tell you that you fall into many snares. You fall directly into Satan's trap when you expect things to just fall out of the sky and land on your head, to be handed to you. And you regard God's blessings that he has put in your life as opportunities for laziness. So Paul says, listen, folks. You need to lead a quiet life, you need to mind your own business, and you need to work. It occurs to me that if I'm busy 
working and tending to my own life, I probably don't have time to mind your business. Now, in Greek culture, they looked down upon, even despised, manual labor. And what I read says that their belief was that the better a man was, the less he should have to work. The better that man was, the less manual labor he should have to do. But as David Gazik writes so well, God didn't see it that way. He gave us a carpenter king. He gave us fishermen apostles. And he gave us tent-making missionaries. So Paul says, brothers and sisters, you lead a quiet life, you mind your business, and you work. And he was very clear as to why. Here's why. People who are not believers will respect that. And the hearing that you wish to have with them, the opportunity you want to be heard can be had. They will listen to you because you are now in their eyes a person of credibility. Well, we change gears a bit now as we come to verse 13. And we talk about the coming of the Lord when Jesus comes back and about resurrection. Let's read 13 and 14. And now, dear brothers and sisters, we want you to know what will happen to believers who have died so that you will not grieve like people who have no hope. For since we believe that Jesus died and was raised to live again, we also believe that when Jesus returns, God will bring back with him the believers who have died. Now, in your study guide, if you would just grab that for a moment, at the bottom of page 69, bottom of page 69, there is a quote from Earl Edwards about a problem that the Thessalonians were having with all of this. Let's read that quote. They had correctly understood that it would be a great and glorious event. He's talking about the second coming of Jesus, featuring the faithful being taken away to be with Christ forever. However... They mistakenly understood that this would all happen immediately before any of them died. Instead, Paul had left them. Christ had not returned. Now some of their loved ones had died. They feared that these loved ones would be denied the privilege of participating in Christ's glorious return. So Paul addresses this. Paul says, I don't want you to be uninformed. Maybe you have one of those translations that says, I would not have you ignorant brethren. Now, if there was a period right there, that would make a whole sermon all unto itself, wouldn't it? I would not have you uninformed about those who have fallen asleep, about those who sleep in death. And I think you know and understand that sleep was a common way to talk about death in the ancient world. It is also a common theme throughout the scriptures. Paul wanted them to know, he wanted to address their concern about what was going to happen to their loved ones who had died and Jesus had not yet come back. And what happens is when Jesus returns, God is going to bring back with him the believers who have died. Now if you look at the text three times in his five verse response, Paul tells the Thessalonians that those who are asleep are going to be first. They're going to be first. He is clearly addressing and responding to their concern, the concern the Thessalonians had about the coming of the Lord. And the term asleep as a euphemism was pretty common in Greek and Latin literature. So clearly believers who have already died for whatever reason or reasons precede those who are still living. And let's just read what he says there beginning in 15. We tell you this directly from the Lord. We who are still living when the Lord returns, we will not meet him ahead of those who have died. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a commanding shout, with the voice of the archangel and with the trumpet call of God. First, the believers who have died will rise from their graves. Then, together with them, we who are still alive and remain on the earth will be caught up in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air then we will be with the Lord forever. So encourage one another with these words. Here is why the Christian does not sorrow, does not grieve like those who have no hope. Are you ready? I'm going to give you the reason why. Paul gives you the reason why. 
We have more hope than just a, a wishful hope of resurrection. And I'm talking now about our, our own resurrection, okay? When Jesus walked out of that tomb early on a Sunday morning, death was conquered forever. And more than that, the wages of sin, the just punishment, the, the deserved recompense of my guilt was conquered as well. So listen to Paul as he says, God is going to bring with Jesus those who sleep in him. We will be resurrected. We will certainly live. And Paul is making it abundantly clear. Our union with Jesus Christ has much greater power and is much stronger than the power of death. And that is why we do not grieve. We do not sorrow as those who have no hope. Now let's think for a moment about someone who never who has never acknowledged Jesus Christ, who has never accepted Him as the Son of God, who, who does not have faith in Jesus, who doesn't believe in Him, who's, who's just denied Him. When a lost sinner dies, we should mourn for them. It's appropriate that we mourn for them. If you read the Scriptures and you believe what the Bible says, the outcome, the proposition of the outcome that they face is not too good, is it? It's not too good. When a believer dies, we really mourn for us, don't we? We, we mourn for ourselves because their circumstance is now better than ours. David wrote in Psalm 4 and verse 8, In peace I will lie down and sleep, for you alone, O Lord, will keep me safe. So, as Paul answers their concerns... As Paul talks about Jesus coming back, in verse 15, I want you to notice that he says, Friends, what I am telling you is not coming from me. This is not from Paul. This is, this is not one of those cases where he says, Now, this is Paul. This is not the Lord. In fact, exactly the opposite. It's, it's not what I think. It's, it's not what I have come up with and concluded. It is not what I have surmised. What I am now telling you comes directly from the Lord. This comes on direct authority from God. Well, well, when did he get it, Jim? And, and, and where was he when he got this from God? I'm going to give you a deeply theological answer. I have no clue. I don't know. I do not know. And you know what? It really doesn't matter, does it? Doesn't make any difference. What matters is that, that Paul had received this from the Lord. I, I think you call that inspiration, don't you? And Paul wanted his Thessalonian brothers and sisters who were so concerned about their own loved ones who had died, he wanted them to be at ease. Jesus will come back. And Paul says, I've got this on direct personal authority from God himself. He will come back. And when he does come back, the very first people who are going to rise to meet him are the dead in Christ, those who sleep in Christ. You look at your text very carefully because the second coming of Jesus is described quite vividly. When Jesus comes, he will come personally. This is not some governmental thing, okay? It will be the Son of God Himself. No representative, no special envoy, no delegation. It will be Jesus. It will be the Son of God, the agent of creation, the one who died in our place. When He comes back, it will be Jesus. And, and He will come with a shout. The Greek word that is used for shout just here is the same word that would be used to describe the commands of a ship's captain as he is shouting out, as he is commanding his rowers, as he's giving them authoritative instruction. It's the same word that is used to describe a military commander speaking to his soldiers. This is no secret mission. This is no stealth arrival. I promise you, no matter what you are doing at the time, no one is going to miss the coming of the Lord. You will not miss it. 
you will also notice that there will be the voice of an archangel. As I read and study, the only one I know about described in the Bible is Michael. Does that mean he is the only one? Does that mean he is the one Paul is referring to? Could there be some other? I'm going to give you that deep theological answer again. I have no clue, have no idea. But somehow and some way, there's going to be a great shout and the voice of an archangel is going to be involved and all of that is going to be a part of Jesus' return. There will also be, you will notice, the trumpet of God. Now, in the Old Testament, believers were gathered, you remember, they were gathered with the trumpet of the Lord and, and trumpets sounded the alarm for battle and trumpets were used sometimes to throw an enemy into panic. 1 Corinthians 15 talks about the last trumpet. And if you read the Revelation, even though a lot of that I'm not sure I understand, when I read the Revelation, I read about the seven trumpets gathering the elect. I, I certainly don't think I can sort all of that out, but I can tell you in full assurance when Jesus comes back, you won't miss it. You are going to know it and you are going to hear it. You'll hear the shout. You'll hear the voice of an archangel. You'll hear the trumpet of God. And Paul says, when all of that sound happens, Thessalonians, your loved ones who died in Christ that you're so concerned about, they are going to rise first. How all of that happens, I do not know. But I'll tell you, I believe it. Do you believe it? I believe it. And I believe Paul, in the book of 1 Corinthians, in chapter 5, when he talks about being absent from the body, and that conversely that means he is present with the Lord. Do you realize, folks, in order to be with the Lord... Unless he comes back sometime relatively soon, you're going to have to die. We, we've got to make that transition. That's going to be part of the process. And, and you see, I don't have to know and to understand all of the details about how that's, that's going to work. God will reveal it to me and God will reveal it to you in his own good time. What I have to know and what I have to believe is it is going to happen. I remember when I was a kid growing up at the great Madison Church, I remember Brother North used to like to talk about when the Lord comes back and how we're going to be changed and we're all going to get new bodies. And he would say the, the same thing every time. Is why I have such a vivid memory of it. He would say the new body that you get is going to be galvanized. It won't rust. It won't wear out. Nothing bad is going to happen to it. I sort of envision for me personally that when the Lord comes back and I get a new body, that my new body is going to be about six feet, eight inches tall. What do you think? Maybe that'll be part of it. Here's what I'm confident in. I'm confident in God. And I'm confident that his promise is true. And I am confident that those who are still alive will be caught up with Jesus. And I want to ask you and make sure we're clear here. If we're still alive and the Lord comes back this week, where are we going to meet him? What does the text say? Where are we going to meet him? Look at your text. You can talk. And I checked with headquarters. It's okay. Where are we going to meet him? In the air. In the air. Now, I got this thing about heights. No pun intended. I do. I got this thing. I've been working on re restoring an old barn on my farm. And uh, this week I've been 30 feet up on a ladder. And you know, you can pray a lot when you're 30 feet up on a ladder. So I'm, I'm reading this and I'm wondering, I wonder how high in the air we're going to meet the Lord. The important thing is to understand... Jesus has come back to claim his church. 
So if you look at the text there, the translation of caught up just here literally means to seize. It literally means to carry off by force. I like that. I like that. Jesus is going to carry me off by force. I belong to him. I'm going to meet him in the air, and he's going to seize me. He's going to carry me off by his power. And isn't that wonderful? Isn't that encouraging? Nothing can harm me anymore. No one or no thing, including Satan, can touch me any longer. And when Jesus seizes me and carries me off, nothing can take me away from him. I will meet my Lord in the air. I want you to just imagine that for a moment. Just, just think about that for a moment. And then he adds, and thus I will be with him how long? I'm going to be with him forever. Living or dead. If I've been in the grave for a thousand years or I'm still alive here on this earth for however long I may have lived, Jesus is going to gather his people unto himself and we are going to, in the air, go home to be with him forever. And Paul says, friends, let me tell you, you encourage each other with these words. You take comfort in what I have just told you. The Jim Brown translation of what Paul's saying here would be, if you can't be comforted by that, you can't be comforted by anything. The claim that Jesus rose from the dead on the third day and is coming back to call believers out of their graves, to meet him in the air, to be with him forever, is perhaps the greatest scandal of authentic Christianity in the face of a modern and corrupt world. Now you think about this carefully. What we've talked about is so absolutely fundamental to biblical Christianity and to the gospel that to abandon it in any way would mean the end of the Christian faith. Jesus would, would just be one more Palestinian rebel, one more rabbinical teacher, one more false messiah with the worst group of gathered followers than anybody before him or since has ever assembled. And I say all of that to tell you that the denial of his resurrection, his literal resurrection and ours has now become very much a part of modern theology. By the 19th century, so-called biblical scholars began making a distinction between the historical Jesus and the one that Paul is talking to us about. As a matter of fact, as I did research for this lesson, I, I want to read you something. A Vanderbilt University professor writes the following. The tomb of Jesus was not empty, but full. And his body did not disappear. It just rotted away. I will tell you that the Apostle Paul saw the case quite differently. Paul wasn't too worried about what the enlightened or the educated of the day might think. He leaves absolutely no room for negotiation at all. Now you have your Bibles. I'm going to give you a reference here. It's not on the screen, but I'd like for you to look at it. 1 Corinthians 15, verses 13 and 14. 1 Corinthians 15, 13 and 14. But if there is no resurrection of the dead, listen carefully, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain, and so is your faith. You're just wasting your time. The resurrection of Jesus from the dead is the vindication of God's purpose in sending His Son for the redemption of sinners. See, here's where the rub comes in. The world is filled with people who do not see themselves as sinners. And thus they want nothing to do with Jesus as their sinless substitute. Death no longer has power over him. And that means death no longer has power over you. You who belong to him. I am unchained from the power and the bondage of my sin by Jesus and his resurrection. I am cleansed from sin 
and the power of death and the power of hell by Jesus and his resurrection. My sin is buried forever in the grave of God's forgetfulness because Jesus is alive and is coming back. So my hope, this hope that Paul writes about, is not just wishful thinking. My hope is in a risen Redeemer that's going to come again in power and glory. And I'm supposed to be living my life in great anticipation of that moment. When he comes, we're going to go with him. When he comes and we go, we'll be with him forever. So let's listen to Paul. And let's love the people around us in real and tangible ways so they will know us. So we will be credible before them. So they will be confident in us. So they will trust us and listen to us. And we will have earned before them the right to be heard. And when they ask for the reason behind this hope that we have, May we very carefully and gently share the gospel with them and invite them to have that hope as well. These words we have read today from 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, friends, do not forget, these are the words of God for us, for the people of God. So thanks be to God. Appreciate you being in our class today.